Okay, we're back. We're live. Four o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, that's Ray Starling. We're co-hosting this program called Hawaii State of Clean Energy. It's our Wednesday energy flagship program on behalf of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And today we're entitling our episode, What Does the Consumer Advocate Do? And we're calling this the core of consumer advocacy in Hawaii, featuring Dean Nishina, Executive Director of the Division of Consumer Advocacy of the State of Hawaii. Welcome, Dean. Thank you for having me. Nice to have you. You know, <clears throat> you know, if we, we didn't notice it right away, uh, soon enough, Ray and I especially, have, having observed all the players on the ball field, we noticed that things change. They do change. And if you wait around long enough, you see, you know, swirling initiatives that come and go. You see organizations that come and go. You see leadership that disappears and comes and goes. Um, you see industrial players that come and go. It's like, you know, just when you thought things were settling down, it always reminds you that things are always in change. Tout la même, tout ça change. That means things are the same, but things are always changing. And one of the changes of note is that Jeff Ono, who was a consumer advocate for what, five years or something? Um, about six. Yeah, six, yeah. oh, yeah. but who's counting? Yeah. Okay, is gone and went back to private practice, yeah? Uh, and uh, Dean Nishina is now the executive director, and what that really means is he is what is customarily called, what we in the trade call the consumer advocate, yeah? Yes. That's what he is. Yep. Okay, so we take the first 15 minutes of our show to discuss, you know, exactly what is the Office of Consumer Advocate, uh, how is it organized, what it does, uh, what its mission and, and resources are. Why don't you take the lead on this, on these, on these questions, Ray? Okay. Uh, Dean, uh, it's nice to have you with us, and uh, you I know again. you've been around for a long time, and uh, so the way here. you're a good choice, <laughs> I, I think, for uh, the next consumer advocate. But uh, there are a lot of people out there that don't really know uh, what the consumer advocate is all about, and um, and I may even have some misconceptions about it. So, uh, could you kind of give us an outline of what the office does, how it its reporting hierarchy goes? Are you, are you at the top of the heap? Uh, or are there others that uh, sort of engage on behalf of the consumer advocate? So well, there are a lot of questions there. So let me see if I can okay. manage to answer most you of them. You can object if you want. Oh, Multiple compound okay. questions. I should have brought my attorney yeah. to object on my behalf. <laughs> but uh, let's see. First of all, the division is an agency within the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Uh, I think I was mentioning a little while ago, at one point our division was part of the Public Utilities Commission, but uh, it was determined that because we were part of the commission, there was a concern that we might have um, the ability to unduly influence the commission's decisions when we were part of the uh, commission's agency. So we were separated out, and that occurred back in the late 70s, I, I believe. So since then, we've been a separate agency. The idea is you're supposed to be separate and right. independent, right. exercising exactly. independent judgment on these things. Right. Well, uh, uh, independent, uh, well, we're supposed to be representing the consumer's interest, right. and then the co commission is really supposed to be the in independent agency that is the decision maker. Quasi-judicial. And so, yeah. right, quasi-judicial. And so they would take into consideration, say, the requested relief by the utility company, and then our recommendations as to whether or not that request is reasonable or not from the consumer's perspective. Um, so, uh, again, answering some of your questions, um, Organizationally, we are supposed to be able to have about 25 staff. Right now, we, we have 19 incumbents. Um, You're looking? We are looking. We are looking. We, uh, we've been looking for a long time. You know, uh, one of the, the issues we've had for a long time, I, I've been with the division since 1992, uh, has been to find... Wait a minute. Wow. 1992? Yeah, 1992. Let me just do the math on that. It's almost 25 years. <laughs> Give or take. Oh, you're not as young as you look, Dean. <laughs> thank you, I think. Take it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, thank you, I think. Well, again, the white hair. Um, but yes, since 92, um, at one point, our, our staff was down to 11. Uh, it, it's hard to find people who are interested in working for our office because um, there's a lot of work to be done. And depending on the, the application we're working on, you have to be an expert witness and get cross-examined by opposing Ooh. counsel. So you just so, don't go in there and present a position. You have to 
subject yourself to cross-examination about right, it. Right, right. And, and not all witnesses, I, excuse me, not all people look forward to being a witness I'm like sure, that. So sure. uh, again, finding people who are willing to, to be a part of our staff uh, can be a challenge at times. But right. I, I think we've been really lucky. We've been able to find a good core of people um, right now to do the work, who's willing to do the work, who are very good at it. And it's really going to help us as we go through some of the, the issues we're dealing with right now. Um, what, what kind of experts are you talking about? Are experts in engineering? So, yeah, the, to, to sort of get back to uh, Ray's original question, within our division, um, the, the head chief, so to speak, of the division is the executive director. And then there are um, four branches. Let's see if I get this right. There's the, the legal branch where we have um, three attorney positions as well as our office services staff. We have our research analysis branch, we have our rates analysis branch, and we have our engineering branch. And um, one of the things that we've found made it easier for us to find employees is we've converted uh, our, our research analysis branches, our exempt positions, which gives us a little more flexibility in terms of finding people to who, who might be interested. That in That means not civil service. Right, not civil they, service. They can come and go, or they do come and go because they don't have a lock-in career. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we have engineers. Are they, are we they, have are the research guys all lawyers or what? No, actually, um, the people we have, there's one person who has a law degree that in our research analysis uh, branch, but then the chief of our research analysis branch has a PhD in economics. Uh, we also have an, uh, another person who was uh, an engineering background. There is an attorney within the research analysis branch. There's a person who has. Um, she, she actually worked for the Department of Health for a while, so you know her interest. We have a, a wide range of experience and, and knowledge in that branch, which is mm -hmm. we, we find is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, I just uh, I wonder, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, are you called on to take positions on everything the PUC is considering? Uh, I would expect that they would like to hear from you on bloody everything, no? By, by statute, we are parties to every proceeding before the Public Utilities Commission. Um, over time, we have filed what's called a st um, statement of non-participation for certain dockets that perhaps aren't as critical as others. Uh, but otherwise, we do try to take a position in every proceeding. Um, I, I like to say that we do a lot of the heavy lifting in the dockets. Uh, within a docket, there's an uh, either started by an application by a utility company or when the commission files an order opening an investigation. Uh, we conduct what's called discovery, where we issue information requests to help flesh out the record in the docket. Uh, most of the times, uh, we're doing the heavy lifting in terms of trying to flesh out the record. And nobody else is doing that. Yeah. Well, um, for the most the, part, the PUC itself issues subpoenas and and gather information that way, or mm -hmm. do they rely on you to do that? For the most part, I, I think they rely on our information requests. But I will say that the like you were mentioning, change the the commission recently um, within the last few years has been issuing more information requests, whereas in the past, uh, information requests from the commission was very, very rare. When you say the last few years, you mean the last year with Randy Iwasi? Uh, yeah. no, not, not he's just kind of an Randy. activist, isn't he? I mean, he's he, right. he is oh, pretty active. You heard it here on Think Tech, yeah? He is pretty active, <laughs> but um, even with um, the, the staff under um, Chair Morita, as well as um, Chair Caliboso to some degree, there, there were... Um, some IRs coming out. It's just the number has increased within, say, the last couple of years. Interesting. So do, there's do, a dynamic here. Do you ever have uh, sort of a conflict within your own group as to who, which consumer are you representing? And some have, would like for you to go this way, and some might want you to go that way. How do you resolve that internally? That, that is a really great question, Ray, because, you know, we are the consumer advocate. And as you're, as you're noting, there are different consumer groups. And uh, I, I hate to pick on this issue, but, you know, one potential issue uh, we could talk about is the net energy metering issue, where there are certain customers who want, you know, wanted NEM to continue. And then the, the, we were pointing out that there's uh, potential cost s subsidization occurring by the non-participants. And so we were making certain recommendations trying to balance the interests of all consumers. And, and even in our traditional rate, um, rate cases, that, that's like uh, our bread and butter type of thing when a utility company comes in and say, we want to have a 10% rate increase. Even within there, we have to balance consumer interests because let's say the company justifies a 10% increase. 
of that increase, how much should be allocated to, say, residential customers versus commercial customers versus industrial customers? So there's always a lot of balance. And what we try to do is provide analysis on all of the interests of the consumers. And then we basically leave it up to the commission to kind of decide what they believe is reasonable as a decision maker. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we do try to, where we can, um, perhaps ensure that the smaller residential customers have some benefit uh, uh, benefit of, of our representation because mm -hmm. some of the larger players such as you know the department of they defense hire, they hire their own they right? hire their own exactly so they have yeah, representation <laughs> yeah exactly so from that perspective it's the smaller customers that usually don't have the resources for that and and so we i we would i wouldn't say we necessarily bias our positions for the residential customers but they're certainly in our mind as we make our recommendations mm -hmm. do you ever go into that uh, Mm, kind of background when you file some kind of filing with the PUC or whether you when you appear or testify to say well you know we have m multiple <coughs> positions among our constituents among our the people we represent we have a group who wants to do this we have a group who wants to do that um, and but we have evaluated all of that and we kind of lean over here and these are the reasons we lean over here. Well, we want you to know, PUC, that it's not monolithic out there, that there are various viewpoints. Right. Do you tell them that? There, there have been some applications within which our analysis did have that type of presentation. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting spot to be in. It, it, mm -hmm. it is some very challenging. Some people are going to get mad at you when you well, don't buy not, their not position. Some. You know? For the most part, uh, you can never make everybody happy, right? So. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I can make uh, Ray and you happy for a moment. For one minute, I have the power to do that. Watch this. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians or artists to see how we can come together to make a renewable future, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday at two o'clock. We highlight businesses and individuals that are successful in Hawaii and we learn their secrets to their success. I hope you can join us and listen in because we always have a pack of information on successful stories in Hawaii. Aloha. Bingo, we're back. I, I was happy for that one moment. Were you happy? It made me happy. <laughs> okay, good. Ray, how about following up? Okay. Uh, question for Dean. Uh, you know, a lot of change has taken place over the last two or three years and maybe going back five or six years, lots of things have changed and I, it's impacted consumer advocacy, it's impacted the PUC and so forth. Uh, are, are we, do, do we still have all the tools we need to get the job done or are there changes in terms of procedures or representations and so forth that, that we might need to look at to continue this, this uh, march towards renewable energy at 100 percent well i'm, I'm gonna limit I, I will limit my response as it relates to perhaps the regulatory arena because uh, when you ask about whether we have the proper tools i'd offer to some degree i believe the commission and our office does have the proper tools to move forward that being said uh you know we, we do have to look at whether or not changes might be appropriate and necessary to realize the the end goal of 100 percent renewable energy in hawaii and what I mean by that is the, the, the commission really teed it up in terms of whether or not the current utility model is appropriate or, or will allow us to get mm -hmm. there. But also in terms of just how the, the costs associated with that transition, who will incur it, how will it be recovered from the participants and non-participants, th those are some of the issues that we need to look at right now. I know the commission has teed up in the most recent Hawaii Electric Light Company rate case, whether or not performance-based uh, type of rate making might mm -hmm. be appropriate as opposed to the traditional cost of service regulation. So when you ask uh, whether or not we have the right tools, I, I would offer, I think we do,
but it will require us to step back a little bit and see how we might expand the box a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> the big tension, and as far as I've been following it from 2008 on forward, is um, clean versus cheap. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Mina Morita said early on in her role as chair of the PUC that she was trying to protect the consumer from paying a penny too much. On the other hand, on the other hand, in my view, you can, I'd like you to agree or disagree, um, we haven't moved fast enough. We're never going to get there at this rate. We are distracted with so many things. We are a, a veritable picture of distraction. Every time you look, we're distracted by something else. And, and when I say distraction, I mean it slows us down, it gets in the way, it makes it impossible for us to actually move forward in a, in a, in a, uh, with alacrity to get this done. Um, and so, you know, what you have is, is the, the, the notion of cheap gets in the way of the notion of clean. My own view is I don't care about cheap. I want to get the job done. At the end of the day, we're going to be sorry if we don't get the job done for so many reasons. I'd like to know your philosophy about that. I'd like to know how your office treats that issue because I don't think every single uh, consumer advocate feels the same way about that issue. Right. So, you know, the one thing I would point out is generally the most common complaint or comment that we receive from customers is that our utility bill is too high. It's not that we don't have enough green energy. It's our utility bill is too high. So one of the things we're trying to do is balance in terms of the proper path moving forward. We could certainly achieve 100% renewable energy much earlier. I, I, I always joke about it in our office. You know, if, if we don't care what the price is, we could just find the sufficient source of biofuel and just burn it in, in the, 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 the units we have right now, and we'd be there. But our utility bills would increase five, six times just because of the difference between the fuels that they're burning now versus um, biofuel. Um, is that the right path? I don't think so, because if customers can't afford to pay the bill, then we're going to have a different issue. And we will have uh, the customer revolt in terms of whether or not you know, they're, they're satisfied with utility service. So I think one of the things we're trying to do in our office is to do a deeper dive into some of the potential alternatives to evaluate the cost and see. I, I know. Um, Mina always, I shouldn't say always, but she often made the comment of trying to make no regrets decision. And I don't think I can ever make a no regrets decision. I, just by, my, by virtue of my nature, I will always have regrets about any decision I make. But I think we can make least regrets decisions in terms of if we do the proper analysis mm -hmm. and evaluate the support for it as we move forward, we've minimized the regrets we might have on a going forward basis. I certainly agree that the pace could have been faster but by the same token, I don't want us to be rushing into something where at the end of the day, customers are saying, I can't afford to pay my utility bill anymore because it's just too high. Do you remember the famous remark made by Joshua? He was counsel for um, the PUC. What was his name? Strickler? St Strickler. He came to uh, one of our programs at the Plaza Club, and he had this whole allegory about a salad. I don't know if anybody was there, but it was, it was stuck in your brain forever. And he said, <clears throat> we can't have a salad that has a worm in it, because the worm will ultimately, you know, scare away the, the diner, the person in the restaurant. So we, we must exclude all the worms. And, uh, and a worm is a, a, an issue that mm, hasn't been resolved, uh, that undermines, you know, whatever position you want to take. Uh, and a worm is something to be afraid of. The worm is something to make a very conservative decision. And his point in all of that was, we have to be very conservative all the time. When in doubt, don't do anything. Uh, when in doubt, hold back. Um, because if you have one mistake, you're going to get busted for it and all that stuff. Um, I most personally don't believe in that. I, I, I think we have to move forward and take a certain risk about it because this is new territory. Mm -hmm. This is new technology. Right. This is a transformation of our economy. It can't be perfect. By, def by logical, you know, it can't. How do you feel about that? I, I think we might be in the same boat, or at least we might be eating the same salad. Let's put that <laughs> um, I, I don't think waiting for the perfect salad is the answer, because as, as you've indicated, if we were waiting for that perfect salad, we may never get to eat. Um, I, and I kind of like to eat. So I, again, my idea is if we can do the proper analysis so we minimize the risk moving forward, I, I think we'll all get to eat and hopefully we'll enjoy the salad. Uh, hopefully we, we won't have too many worms or they won't be 
worms that'll be too <laughs> off-putting? Well, you know, a big question here is the consumer advocate, in, in my view, can statutorily, you know, take affirmative action to move things ahead. I mean, theoretically, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you could get up in front of the PUC and say, ladies, gentlemen, we have to, we have to do this. We have to move ahead. And the consumer advocate advises you that in our view, you should do this, 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 and this, and get it done. Um, so the consumer advocate can be an activist also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, where is your head about that? Where are, where's your head on these specific issues that either could or maybe don't get it done? Net energy metering, where are you on that? Where are you on time, what do you call it, time, time of, of use? use? Where are you on, what do you call it, self-supply? These issues, uh, uh, they're not yet controversial, but I predict they will be. <laughs> So where do you fit on that? I, I think they're already in that controversial bucket. But yeah, um, really? <laughs> I, I, I think in the past, we, we haven't been as proactive as I think we'd like to be. When I say we, our agency, mm -hmm. um, primarily because of resources. But I, I think now that we're fully staffed, and again, I, I think we've also been fortunate not only to have some um, good staff people join our agency, but we've also developed good relationships with consultants who can help us. Hopefully we can be more proactive. I think one of the really important things that we need to do to move forward with our clean energy transition is trying to establish better pricing signals. Um, NEM is a great example of where it was set up to incent or encourage initial adopters. And so the, the pricing for that was to pro get over that hump of where a person might be looking at it and think, oh, that's too expensive for me. Um, NEM was supposed to help overcome that hump. It was never meant to be the final solution to uh, have in place for distributed generation. If, if your payback for a system that can last 15 years, give or take 15 to 20 years, is four to five years, your, your compensation level is too high. Um, and, and that's why our position in, in them was we, we need to step back and look at the, the cost shifting that's occurring between participants and non-participants. Uh, right now, before the commission, a lot of the, the focus has been on the technical connection issues. And our office has been saying, yes, let's not forget the technical connection issues, but also let's start to ramp up our analysis of the underlying cost aspects of those interconnection issues and what the value of the services that might come from DG and whatnot. Because right now, if we continue to look at those old prices, it's inefficient pricing signals and people are making poor decisions based on outdated or stale information. Um, there hasn't been enough interest because it's difficult um, and certainly not enough effort in, the, in that area. And that's one of the things we've been telling the commission, commission we really need to start to bring up that aspect of, of analysis within the transition to 100% renewable energy. You're probably impressed. I am. Well, I'm, I'm actually very happy to see that you've got uh, a, almost a full staff now, because I think that's a critical factor, especially with so many different things going on. Right. Uh, and one question I had uh, before we close, uh, have you looked outside of Hawaii for other consumer advocate groups in other states that are doing things that, that we might learn uh, from. Uh, that, because I, I found that we can become a little bit insular here, and it's good to get out and even go to the mainland to some conferences mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. a lot of people come together. How, are, you, are you guys in a position where you've got the money and so forth to go do that? Because I think it's very helpful to talk to other people that are doing the same thing in other areas. Right. I, 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 I will say that we have looked at other jurisdictions, although I, I will say that we always take the perspective that it's informative but not necessarily instructional because where Hawaii is right now, it, it's, it's really unique, right? And not only are we not interconnected with other systems, so that certainly changes one of the aspects of the review, but we're, we're much further ahead than most of the other states. So what the other states may or may not be doing, again, can be informational, but I wouldn't necessarily take it as, you know, this is what we need to do in Hawaii. Uh, when we use some of our consultants, the consultants are generally from the mainland, and that's where we rely on mm -hmm. their experience within dealing in other jurisdictions and bringing it to Hawaii. And we try to vet it internally with our consultants as, is this something that might be appropriate for Hawaii? Um, we have had consultants sometimes, they come and they propose something, and it's basically what they did in, uh, not to pick on a state, but say Minnesota or, or, or maybe mm -hmm. Colorado, and they say, this is what you need to do in Hawaii. But really, 
again, you need to step back yeah. and, and look at the differences and determine whether or not that is something that can't, it, it might not even be feasible, really. So, I, I mean, that's usually one of the more interesting discussions we have our, with our consultants. Because mm -hmm. there are consultants, and we'd like to think they're going to advance what we think is the best thing for Hawaii consumers. This isn't it a matter of building credibility with the commission and the public, for that matter? Right. Uh, you have to satisfy all constituencies, at least to some extent, and you have to walk into the Public Utilities Commission and they have to accept a fair chance that they will accept what you are offering and recommending. This is really important. I, I'd like to think they always accept what we say, but, you know, they I'd don't, like they don't that always. Too, but, <laughs> but, you know, that's why we try to make sure we do the best job possible in terms of supporting yeah. whatever recommendation we might offer. Yeah. We are impressed, Dane. Mm -hmm. We are happy that you are here. We are happy you are the consumer advocate now. Well, Good for you. Hopefully, you'll see the same thing in a few months, or you know, even a couple years. Down we'll have you the, back. Does that mean you're going to come back? Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if you want to invite me, let me know. Um, assuming the schedule allows, I, I'm always happy to come back and have this kind of discussion with you. You can run, Dean, but you can't hide. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, a you lot. know where I work. <laughs>